All right, good morning, everybody. Welcome to Grand Rounds. We have several speakers today, but I'm going to introduce um, our leader today, who is Dr. Grace John Stewart. She is a professor in the departments of global health, medicine, epidemiology, and pediatrics at the University of Washington. Her research focuses on advancing infectious diseases research in women, adolescents, and children as part of a collaborative research in Kenya. She is co director of the U UW Center for Global Health of Women, Adolescents, and Children, an Associate Director of UW Fred Hutch Center for AIDS Research, and a member of the Kenya Research and Training Center. Welcome, Dr. John Stewart. I'll let you take it from here. Thank you. I'm really happy to be here, and uh, um, nice to see so many people in the audience, and happy to share a little bit about Global Watch, which we hope will be uh, useful to those of you that um, can collaborate with us. Uh, and we're just really delighted to be at Grand Rounds and uh, present today. I'll present this overview of the Global Watch Center just to give you some ideas of how you can link. Um, Global Watch was founded in 2012 as a partnership between the departments of pediatrics, obstetrics, gynecology, and global health. And it really focuses on integrated health of women, adolescents, and children through the life cycle. And there are critical time periods that you can see in this chart um, to the right, where intervening uh, can make a huge difference long term uh, during pregnancy, delivery, the first thousand days of life, through childhood, the preteen period, transition to autonomy and adulthood. And the goal of our center is to contribute scientific discoveries, uh, take time to cultivate leaders, and then to bridge disciplines as we do this. Um, and to think of these groups, um, parents, adolescents, and children together uh, through this life cycle period. Currently, we have 54 active grants, an annual budget of about 20 million, a lot of publications in the last year, and several core faculty and research staff that I've listed here. Our leadership is um, uh, on this slide, and we have uh, faculty and staff leaders who direct the center, uh, including myself, uh, Patricia Pavlinak, who is really important in guiding the Gut Health and Child Survival Group, Irene Jaguna, who helps us as we facilitate partnerships with our international um, collaborators, Kate Rankin, our managing director, Allison Shumais, our research and operations director, Anjali Wagner, who uh, directs uh, the Global Watch Certificate Program, as well as uh, a lot of the activities in HIV through the life cycle. We work in, in many different countries, have spent a lot of time um, in deep relationships in Kenya, uh, and the other countries in the blue on the map are countries that we're involved with currently. The scientific priority areas that currently are our main focus areas include family planning decision support, gut health and child survival, HIV and co-infections through the life cycle. Uh, and I've just listed here different areas of research uh, uh, to get you thinking about uh, potential areas that we could collaborate together. There's a lot of work in mobile technology for Watch Health, emerging um, work on uh, mental health, particularly peripartum depression and adolescent uh, depression pediatric and adolescent HIV, a lot in the gut health, diarrhea, child growth and development areas, as well as uh, some classical infectious diseases and family planning. Uh, and some of the project logos you see to the right, and I don't want to take time from our speakers to go through in detail, but they just give you a sense of some of the ongoing studies that we are, are focusing on. Uh, two things that might be helpful if you're working in global health now, uh, there's a Seeds for Change Award where uh, we try to give small grants to improve patient experiences in uh, uh, limited and middle income countries by improving clinical care, patient satisfaction, and workforce um, and health services. And Rising Stars, where these are early career seed grants for junior investigators from the Global South. Uh, ways that are easy to get involved include the Breakfast with Watch series, uh, that are widely advertised and uh, hopefully you'll be able to attend. Uh, the Global Watch newsletter keeps you abreast of things that might be coming up if you want to link with some of our researchers and research activities. 
annually, uh, we are fortunate to have uh, a donor provide funding for a Delve lecture, uh, which is a faculty exchange uh, um, from usually a limited and middle income country um, leader to help us grow collaborations and think outside of the box in ways to increase our impact for um, Watch Health. We have working groups where you can brainstorm ideas, particularly in implementation science, and I welcome you to look at the website. Dr. Donna Deno, our Associate Director, will be introducing uh, the talks and um, uh, giving us an idea of the whole presentation and leading the Q&A. Thanks so much, Grace. Um, so for those who don't know me, I'm a professor in the Division of General Pediatrics, and I have a joint appointment in the Department of Global Health. I serve as the Associate Director of Global Watch for the Department of Pediatrics, so I'm happy to be a point person if you'd like to connect with Global Watch or have any questions about Global Watch. But today, it's my distinct honor to introduce our three panel speakers on the topic of supporting healthy minds, optimizing neurodevelopment of children in Kenya. Our first speaker, um, Dr. Dalton Wamala, is an associate professor in the Department of Pediatrics and Child Health at the University of Nairobi. He earned his MBCHB and Master of Medicine in Pediatrics and Child Health from the University of Nairobi and his MPH from UW. He has a long-standing research experience and expertise in pediatric and adolescent HIV and has published extensively in this area. Dr. Wamala also provides technical support to Kenya's National AIDS and STI Control Program. And he's also a mentor on the REACH pathway collaboration between the Seattle Children's UW Residency Program and the University of Nairobi Pediatric Residency Program. Um, I'll introduce our other two speakers as well. Um, Dr. Sarah Benke Nugent is currently clinical assistant professor in the Department of Global Health at UW. And as of July 1st, she'll be transitioning to associate professor in the UW Department of Medicine Division of Allergy and Infectious Diseases. She is a virologist and epidemiologist by training. She earned her MS in epi, in epi and um, PhD in microbiology at UW. Her research focuses on child development and hearing outcomes, including the roles of perinatal HIV infection and exposure and air pollution on these outcomes. Her goal is to inform therapeutic, psychosocial, and policy level interventions to improve cognitive and mental health outcomes in infants, children, adolescents affected by these exposures. And our last speaker, last but not least, is Dr. Michelle Bolteras, who is a postdoctoral researcher in the UW Department of Global Health. Dr. Bolteras has a background in cultural anthropology and she earned her MPH and PhD in epidemiology at UW with a concentration in maternal and child health. Her current research focuses on using mixed methods to study the role of HIV in fam family dynamics, relationships, father engagement, and child neurodevelopment in Kenya and Botswana. She is interested in designing and testing interventions using community-based participatory research methods. Um, Grace, has Dr. Walmala been able to join us? I don't see him here. I can go ahead and pull up his slides and I will not be able to do as wonderful a job as Prof. Walmala would have done. Um, uh, we're hoping in this session to really talk about studies that think about optimizing neurodevelopment of children in Kenya. Uh, and uh, in this talk, there are no disclosures uh, that we uh, need to make. The objectives of our talk is to describe the scope, mechanisms, and implications of HIV-associated neurodevelopmental and neurocognitive disorders in children living with HIV. Um, and then you'll hear a little bit about common methods of assessment and challenges in conducting neurodevelopmental assessments in resource-limited settings. We'll talk about describing early neurodevelopmental and neurocognitive outcomes in children with HIV uh, exposure. Uh, who don't have HIV. And then I've already given you some ways that you can collaborate, but they'll also be sprinkled throughout the talk, uh, concepts that might give you ideas on how you can collaborate together with Global Watch. Uh, and finally, um, think about innovative approaches to move further and, and what we can do in terms of um, intervening to improve outcomes for uh, neurodevelopment in children with either HIV or HIV exposure. So currently worldwide, 
there's an estimated 1.5 million children living with HIV, and this is zero to 14 year olds. Obviously, there are many perinatally uh, uh, infected children living with HIV who are older in addition to this. And every year, about 130,000 new infections. In Kenya, uh, there are 68,000 children living with HIV. Uh, and currently, uh, we're so um, pleased to see children on effective antiretroviral therapy living longer into adolescence and adulthood. And many of these adolescents and youth started their treatment at the point that they had uh, been diagnosed with advanced HIV. Uh, in addition to biologic um, issues that complicate neurodevelopment in children with HIV, uh, children uh, in HIV-affected families sometimes have socioeconomic disadvantage and are much more likely to be orphaned. And all of this can play into uh, neurodevelopment and neurocognition in these children. Um, so there's a wide spectrum of CNS pathology in children with HIV. Uh, early on, before the uh, availability of antiretroviral treatment, there was HIV encephalopathy quite frequently described in children with HIV. And these were in progressive or static forms. Uh, beyond encephalopathy, uh, a broader group of children might have acquired HIV and neurocognitive disorders where the global function is normal, but there were selected domains that had um, uh, effects. And finally, children with HIV might have other neurologic complications such as seizures and stroke and, and complications of infections such as uh, meningitis, particularly TB meningitis. Um, so an early case series that was led by Dr. James Lesky uh, in the 80s when uh, HIV was first being characterized uh, noted the progressive brain disease in children with HIV. The clinical picture included a loss of developmental milestones, motor weakness, and uh, a predisposition to acquiring microcephaly. And on imaging, there was brain atrophy and cortical thinning. Um, by definition, HIV encephalopathy in children uh, includes a loss of failure to attain milestones uh, and impaired brain growth on imaging studies and an acquired symmetric motor de deficit. And all of these um, are outlined here, and at least one of these should persist for over two months. And to make the diagnosis of HIV encephalopathy in children, it has to be done in the absence of concurrent illness, such as a CNS infection. Um, so uh, as I mentioned earlier, the prevalence of HIV encephalopathy in the pre-ART era was quite high, as, uh, as high as 20 to 60 percent. It occurred very early, often in the first year of life, uh, and uh, was uh, associated in, uh, with severe immunosuppression in children that had a CD4 percent of less than 15 percent. In a study that we conducted in Nairobi called OPH, uh, even when children received ART in the first year of life, uh, there was still a high prevalence of microcephaly, and those children that had microcephaly had a much higher uh, hazard risk of mortality. Uh, in the SHARE study in South Africa, similarly, where tr children were treated in the first few years of life, uh, again, HIV encephalopathy was lower than what I said uh, in the pre-ART era, but still fairly high at 15%. And in the PACTG 219C study, uh, HIV encephalopathy was associated with having a CD4% less than 15% or an age less than one year. Uh, this study in Cape Town, South Africa, uh, a little bit uh, further on, maybe a decade after the OPH and SHARE studies that I talked about earlier, uh, looked at why children with HIV were referred to a neurologist. And uh, of the 145 children that were referred, uh, a lot of them had HIV encephalopathy. And um, this included microcephaly and spastic diplegia. Uh, and the median age of children with HIV encephalopathy was about five years, 64 months. Uh, and 45% uh, had started ART less than a year of age. And 70% had viral suppression. So there's still uh, residual impact of HIV in those early days of uh, trying to get treatment to children um, within the first year of life.
And some of the findings that you can see to the right include why the children were referred, and that includes that uh, maybe uh, not doing well in school, having to repeat a school year, behavioral problems, ADHD, seizures, uh, but importantly, delayed early speech and delayed walking were very prevalent in this group of children who were referred. And on imaging, uh, a wide variety of findings, including global atrophy, uh, some white matter loss, signal change, and thinning of the corpus callosum. So HIV encephalopathy may occur either due to direct HIV repl replication in the CNS or um, HIV-related immunopathology. Um, and as uh, HIV is replicating, there could be cytokines that cause inflammation, and this inflammation could lead to uh, demyelination or continued persistent inflammation that leads to um, effects that you see in, in cognition. Uh, as uh, children have been treated with ART, the, uh, a study, nice study in the U.S. has followed children over time and looked at what happened after ART was introduced. Uh, and so you can see in the blue line the percent for 100 person years of HIV encephalopathy, and you can see it coming down as ART was introduced, say, in 1996. So the proportion on heart in the red line goes up, and you can see the proportion who have uh, HIV encephalopathy going down. So a big decline, tenfold decline in HIV encephalopathy after ART. And after that, there's still some persistent HIV encephalopathy that people are seeing um, that uh, that is important to, to, to attend to. There are some studies that suggest CNS penetrating regimens have lower incidence of HIV encephalopathy and have some survival benefit. So what do we know about neurocognitive disorders in children and adolescents? Um, again, the, children and adolescents may have generally good global functioning of the brain, but sometimes there are selected domains that are affected. And, and most of these domains are related to executive function. And that includes uh, important impact on processing speed, working memory, planning and reasoning, cognitive flexibility, and inhibitory control. Uh, and even in the era of ART, there's evidence that there's fairly high prevalence in uh, uh, of these cognitive uh, um, compromises in children with, living with HIV. And some of these don't entirely resolve with ART, and it's not clear why. There's compartmentalization of, of HIV, so sometimes a completely systemically virally suppressed individual might have virus detectable in the CNS. That might be part of what's going on, or it could be due to residual inflammation. A systematic review and meta-analysis was conducted in Africa, uh, and six of the studies compared children with HIV versus HUU, and that HUU stands for children who are uninfected and unexposed to HIV. Uh, and in this study, there were uh, detectable effects in uh, working memory, processing speed, and executive function, such that children with HIV had, or had poor outcomes in all of these. Uh, just to say that there was continued uh, evidence of cognitive dysfunction despite ART. And this is just reiterated in this slide that shows that if you treat a child early, there's benefit compared to late treated children. Uh, but even with early treatment, there's still some evidence of uh, neurocognitive dysfunction on neuropsychologic testing. Uh, and so this was the SHARE cohort in South Africa. And um, early on at 12 months of age, the early treated children performed as well as children without HIV. But when they followed them later out to seven and nine years, there was some evidence of some uh, deficits on auditory working memory and executive function at seven and nine years compared to children without HIV um, and even children uh, who are uninfected and unexposed to HIV. Over time, um, there's some improvement. As children continue to grow and are on ART for some time, there's improvement in their cognition, uh, but despite this improvement, the improvement is not as good in children with HIV as in children uh, who don't have HIV. And here you can just see to the right 
the group of children with HIV, and they are improving over time, um, but not to the level of the children on the left, who are children who don't have HIV, but were exposed to HIV in utero. And we'll talk a little bit more about that group. But in this comparison, the children on, on ART didn't catch up to the children who just had exposure but didn't have HIV infection. Um, and the typical findings currently on children with HIV uh, who have some of these deficits are cortical and subcortical atrophy, lower gray matter volumes, white matter atrophy and cortical thinning, white matter microstructural abnormalities, and intracerebral cal calcification. And it's interesting, the scope and degree of the cognitive impairment doesn't directly correlate with the severity of the brain abnormalities on imaging. Uh, and again, um, people are just trying to sort out why children with HIV have neurocognitive um, compromises. Uh, and there's evidence that there's synaptodendritic damage with a skew towards simplification, neuronal network damage. And these are in areas of the brain that mediate learning, memory, and executive function. And some of the changes in brain volume may indicate this synaptodendritic damage. And these changes, as I've said earlier, may persist from the pre-ART period for patients. Um, and because we see these uh, effects despite ART, um, it may not just be the direct viral effects. It may be that the sustained immune activation, oxidative stress, metabolic changes might be the things that are really driving the effects that we see in children. And as I alluded to before, drugs only do so well when it comes to the CSF and the CNS. Uh, and there's a persistent CNS reservoir that probably leads to persistent uh, impact on brain function. Now, um, brain function, as we all know, is so um, complex and multifactorial in terms of what influences it and a variety of things are listed on this directed acyclic graph where you can see it's a lot of social factors as well as biologic factors. Uh, and trying to understand which of these is the most important in these children is, is just in early days. Um, so currently our approach is start ART as early as possible. Um, there's limited evidence for other interventions. There's hope that uh, cognitive interventions might make a difference. The broader literature suggests that nutritional supplementation or caregiver training might be useful. Uh, there's an interest in moving towards uh, frameworks like the nurturing care framework that looks at all these in, in combination. Nutrition for optimal growth and development, health free from childhood illnesses, protection of children and opportunities for early learning with playful stimulation, and responsive caregiving. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about that in the other talks. So I'll end here and pass it on to Dr. Sarah Benke Nugent for the next part of the session. So Grace just mentioned the nurturing care framework, and this has the overarching goal of supporting the early years of child growth and development because these supports can have far reaching impacts um, through adolescence and adulthood. And my talk is gonna focus on what we're doing to try to understand how HIV exposure affects child development with the hope that um, this information will ultimately inform strategies like nurturing care to support children with HIV exposure. So just to highlight the importance of the sequential um, building of different capacities during brain development. Um, in early infancy, sensory capacities such as hearing develop first, followed by language, and then early cognitive skills begin to develop in the first year of life. And I'm going to come back to the importance of early hearing and neurodevelopment in my talk a few times, given their importance for future cognition and higher order cognitive skills such as executive functioning. And at the beginning of this talk, Grace highlighted one of the major successes in all of this, which is that the number of new HIV infections in children has dramatically declined over the past decade. And that's shown by this um, trend line um, uh, on this chart. Now, the pink bars actually show us um, one of the reasons for the success, namely that access to antiretroviral viral therapy for pregnant persons living with HIV has dramatically increased. 
And that means with that success, the global child population with HIV exposure who are uninfected or CHEU are increasing. And today, an estimated 16 million children uh, within the world um, are CHEU, um, and over a million are born annually. And this population of children comprises up to one fifth of the child population in certain countries. Now, um, several studies have documented uh, worse survival outcomes, increased morbidity, and increased growth faltering in CHUU. And studies are also showing that uh, CHEU um, have poor develop neurodevelopmental outcomes and in addition may have increased risk of hearing loss. And I'm gonna focus on these latter two outcomes today because they are so important for future outcomes for children and because um, of the broad implications of even subtle differences in these outcomes may have given the size of the CHEU population. Now, there are many, many plausible mechanisms that um, could underlie this relationship between underlying HIV exposure and neurodevelopment. And I'll highlight one right now, which is the potential exposure of antiretroviral therapy in utero and in early life and its effect on brain development. So over the past 20 years, um, there, have many, there have been many changes in guidelines for pregnant people living with HIV for their HIV treatment, as well as changes in guidelines for prophylaxis of HIV for their infants. Um, and in 2016, there was a major shift in HIV treatment guidelines to recommend treatment for all people diagnosed with HIV immediately upon diagnosis. Um, and since 2016, there have also been, there's also been an evolution in regimens such that there have been new regimens that are more efficacious. Now, what that means is that um, over time, there has been better health in pregnancy for persons living with HIV who are pregnant. There have been um, better access to antiretrovirals preconception, and then also better access to more efficacious regimens. But at the same time, there has also been a diversity of exposures to antiretroviral therapy across the generations of CHEU, and we don't yet understand the implications of those exposures for fetal and early life brain development. Uh, recent meta-analysis showed that there were subtle language and motor differences in CHEU versus children who are unexposed and uninfected, or CHUU, at age two years. And there have been fewer brain imaging studies of these children, but two recent studies show that infants with HIV exposure had lower gray matter volumes and also lower subcortical volumes in certain regions. And in addition, um, in certain analyses, infants with HIV exposure whose mothers had immunosuppression in pregnancy had more pronounced differences in one study. And in another study, infants whose mothers had started ART, ART um, post-conception had larger difference than those who started ART pre-conception, ART being antiretroviral therapy. Now, there have also been fewer studies of neurocognitive outcomes in school-aged children with HIV exposure. And we looked at this in Kenya using a detailed, well-valid, detailed, widely used uh, battery for neurocognitive functioning. We found that CHUU had significantly lower scores for cognitive ability, for memory, attention, and processing speed. And the effect sizes of these differences range from 0.3 to 0.8 standard deviations. Now, this group of children was born from 2004 to 2011, and it spans that relatively early time in the pre-treat all era that I just talked about. But a more recent cohort, which was born from 2005 to 2016 and spans this pre-treat era also had lower scores for work working memory as well as processing speed. Now, for children who were born post-treat all, ongoing studies that we're conducting in collaboration with Brent Collette here at the Department of Pediatrics 
are involving detailed neurodevelopmental assessments and also exploratory executive function executive functioning assessments in preschoolers who happen to have very detailed characterization of exposures that we think might be related to biologic mechanisms. And these cohorts are very helpful for helping us to understand the relationships of these exposures. So I'll just highlight a few points before I go on to tell you about our studies on hearing. Um, I told you about subtle early differences as well as school age differences in developmental outcomes in CHEU. And these are very critical given the size of the child population. Um, I told you about early subtle or early motor and language scores specifically, and these could have implications for higher order cognitive skills, including executive functioning. And then the differences in memory and attention at school age that we observed in Kenya could also have implications for executive functioning and suggest that this capacity may be different in children with HIV exposure. So what we really need are large scale studies of school aged children who've been followed from birth with detailed exposure information to help us understand the biologic mechanisms that are underlying those exposures, as well as the implications of these differences for the health, educational and economic attainment of these children. Very important given the size of the population. So before I go on to tell you about our studies in hearing, I'll just remind you of the importance of hearing in, in development and it's important in future cognitive and executive functioning development. Um, Torre et al. Um, found a 10.5% prevalence of hearing loss in CHEU in the United States. And this compared to, a, this basically meant it was consisted of a twofold difference in, in, in risk of hearing loss compared to the general population. So we were curious to look at this in Kenya. Um, we leveraged an ongoing study called HOPE to ask the question of do infants with HIV exposure have higher risk of hearing loss? And um, we completed 884 screens in infants. We did not find a difference in HIV exposure was associated with risk, but we did find that the rate of hearing loss was 7.9 per thousand overall. And this compares with one to two per thousand, which was recently reported by the CDC in the United States. We also found that 65% of caregivers of referred infants did not return for diagnostic evaluation. So to follow up on this, um, Sarah Degua at the University of Nairobi and Emily Gallagher here at the Department of Pediatrics and I now have an R21. And um, the goal of the R21 is to test reliability of some newer technologies for hearing screening. And if successful, um, its companion R33 will involve serial follow-up of hearing outcomes in infants with HIV exposure so we can continue to try to understand whether or not these children children have increased risk as they age towards school age. And to follow up on the high loss to follow up to diagnostic evaluation, not a T32 fellow Nada Ali is examining um, caregiver and provider perspectives on the continuum of care for hearing and specifically follow up of care for, for children with hearing loss. So just to summarize a few points um, before I hand it off to Michelle, we found high rates of hearing lo loss, early onset hearing loss in Kenya, and we hope to do future studies of hearing in CHEU. And what we would like to do is focus on older ages and risk factors such as middle ear fluid to understand there's increased risk of hearing loss as children age and whether or not there's a potential impact of middle ear fluid on that risk. Considering the high rates of early onset hearing loss, it's important to um, understand what we can do to improve strategies to improve uptake of hearing diagnostic evaluation, as well as um, interventions for children identified to have hearing loss. Uh, and these studies will likely focus on, on caregivers. So with that, I'm going to take us back to the importance of the nurturing care framework. And I'm gonna hand it off to Michelle, who will tell you more about caregiver interventions. Thank you. Thank you so much. Hi, everyone. Um, it's really an honor to be here today. My name is Michelle, and I will be discussing family dynamics that could influence child neurodevelopment in the context of HIV. 
And I wanted to note that the photos in this presentation are either publicly available images or photos I've taken myself with parental consent. Uh, they are not intended to depict or imply health status of any of the subjects, but the photographs are merely intended to serve as a reminder that there are these real lives and colorful and vibrant lived experiences behind the numbers that we often see in a data set. So Sarah introduced us to this figure, and based on the current state of the literature, the biologic mechanistic pathways uh, through which HIV exposure perinatally could imp impact child neurodevelopment um, are pretty well established at this point. And what we decided to focus on next and what I will be presenting on today are some of the social behavioral pathways that synergistically impact child neurodevelopment but are not as well understood or studied in this context. So common risk factors for poor child development are magnified among families affected by HIV. And these include caregiver distress, depression, anxiety, household violence, relationship instability, uh, food insecurity, father absence, and I could go on. Um, and there's an urgent need for multidisciplinary research to identify the household factors that impact child neurodevelopment in Kenya and what which we believe could maybe be more approachable and readily modifiable through caregiver-based interventions. So we are nearing the end of a large multi-site prospective longitudinal cohort study across multiple sites in Kenya, in which we enrolled 2,000 mother-infant pairs, 1,000 of whom were children um, HIV exposed, uninfected, and what the other 1,000 were HIV unexposed. We enrolled children at six weeks old, and we have followed them every six months, um, and they are now turning three years old. So in this exploratory analysis, um, we assessed whether child neurodevelopment scores were associated with maternal HIV status, relationship dynamics and different factors there, and then father engagement measures. When comparing sociodemographic differences between CHEU, so children exposed, uh, HIV exposed uninfected, to CHUU, children HIV unexposed uninfected, at two years old, we saw that children HIV exposed were more likely to have older mothers and fathers, caregivers with fewer years of education. We also saw lower food security as well, as well as lower father support. And in addition, we measured multiple relationship stability and satisfaction measures. And we did see significant differences for CHEU in particular across all of these measures. And I wanted to highlight that several of these, if not all of them, have been identified as known risk factors for poor child neurodevelopment. So to assess child neurodevelopment at two years old, we conducted a culturally appropriate neurodevelopment tool called the Malawi Developmental Assessment Tool, otherwise known as MDAT. And this generates scores for social, language, fine motor, and gross motor domains. So I'm gonna go into our results within each of these domains. So I ran mixed methods, linear regression models, adjusting for multiple potential confounders, including child age and sex, maternal age, marital status, and education level. In our first analysis, we compared MDAT scores between children who are HIV exposed to children who are HIV unexposed. And we did find that CHEU scored significantly lower in the gross motor domain. And then next, we looked at all children adjusting for maternal HIV status. And we compared children assigned male versus female at birth. And we saw that males performed worse in almost all of the domains. And this finding is consistent with uh, other analyses that we have done, as well as other analyses of our colleagues in the space. Um, but it still remains a bit unclear whether this is a function of the analysis uh, assessment tools at this age, or truly um, a function of slower development among infant boys, but this should be explored further. Next, we found a positive correlation between the number of years parents have been together and improved scores for children in the language and fine motor domains. We also looked at multiple caregiver relationship satisfaction and stability characteristics. I wanted to highlight just three here. Um, we saw that multiple were associated with lower scores in the social and fine motor domains, including a mother uh, frequently considering separating with her partner rarely confiding in each other, 
and rarely engaging in shared interests together. And additionally, we looked at multiple father engagement factors, which were also associated with child social scores. So um, just to highlight, we found that high, we found higher scores among children who lived with their fathers compared to children who did not live with their fathers. And we also saw that um, children who saw their fathers at least every day or every week um, had improved scores compared to children who saw their fathers every one to two months. So these findings inspired us to recently launch a photo voice study with fathers of children in the HOPE study. Photo voice, if you're not familiar, is a community-based participatory research technique uh, that involves giving participants each a camera to capture visual life narration based on the specific prompts that we ask. So for example, um, please take a picture of something that you provide for your family or for your child. Um, please take a picture of something that you wanna teach your child about. Please take a picture of something that you do to manage your stress and pressures of fatherhood. And participants then come together to discuss their images, select their favorites of the group, um, and then they work together to add meaning in the form of captions for each of the images that they've selected. And this method engages participants in every stage of the research process from data collection, analysis to interpretation. So it's a really exciting method that um, we're using now. And the objective of this current study is to understand the roles that fathers play in their families and their own preferences around father-focused interventions to, to harbor and maintain healthy relationships with their partners, as well as promote early child development. In addition, we have partnered with the FACET study in Botswana, which is led by myself and Dr. Kathleen Powis at Harvard. So in this partnership, we are conducting parallel qualitative studies between HOPE and the FACET study to understand the composition of families within the Kenyan and Botswanan fam within the context of HIV um, and try and understand the composition of families, as well as to understand caregiver perspectives on the WHO nurturing care framework, which Sarah just introduced us to. And we're also interested in father engagement and strategies to promote healthy father engagement. So to understand the composition of families, we asked mothers in Botswana to draw out the people involved in their child's life. Who helps care for their child? Uh, mothers then share their drawings in their focus group discussions and describe the ways in which each person that they have drawn provides a form of care for their child, um, whether that's emotional, physical, financial, and so on. I just wanted to point out here that on the far right in green, um, a mother drew Peppa Pig on the television uh, and then described that Peppa Pig comforted her child and therefore deserved a spot on the caregiving team. So this was more of an icebreaker for the activities. The real meat of the activities uh, was around the nurturing care framework. So we are doing interactive um, activities using stickers uh, here to understand mother perspectives on the nurturing care framework domains. Um, and very soon we will be gathering father perspectives too to see if they are different. Uh, as a reminder, the Nurturing Care Framework comprises five domains, which, if adequately provided, um, a child should have the best chance of meeting their developmental potential and thriving. So in this activity, we gave different colored stickers to caregivers and asked them to put a blue sticker on the most important domain, a green sticker on the easiest domain that they feel that they can provide for their child, as well as a orange or red sticker um, to put on the domain that they find to be most challenging to provide for their child. So we have some preliminary data now from 80 mothers in Botswana, and I wanted to share a couple of tidbits. So if we were to look at the most important domains to mothers in Botswana, we see that physical and mental health, adequate nutrition, security and safety were all rather equally important to caregivers. Uh, if we were to look at the easiest domains to provide, we see that responsive caregiving is a clear winner. Uh, when prompted to understand why, a mother said responsive caregiving is the easiest for me to provide because it is the only domain that feels within my control. Um, all of the other domains um, felt out of their control, especially adequate nutrition, security, and safety, which actually fathers played a large role in. Uh, we also looked at the most challenging to provide, and I wanted to highlight opportunities for early learning here. 
So um, I wanted to highlight two quotes, actually. One says, when they say opportunities for early learning, I see it more as opportunities for, for uh, as early learning for me as the mother. I will learn so that tomorrow I can teach my child. And there is so much involved in this, raising children. There are illnesses. There is a lot in that. I need to learn for that baby before I can hold her in my arms and how we will develop our bond, you see. I also wanted to highlight that our research group is launching and planning um, multiple composite interventions to address several of these domains at once. As you can see, it's not just opportunities for early learning that is difficult, but there are mothers who find all of these domains to be difficult at one time or another. So in conclusion, we found subtle but significant differences in gross motor scores between children who are HIV exposed and unexposed. Relationship satisfaction and father engagement factors were associated with child neurodevelopment scores, regardless of maternal HIV status. But a lot of these family risk factors are heavily amplified uh, among the families affected by HIV. Lastly, caregiver-based interventions can be incredibly useful to support families affected by HIV and relationship instability and should be culturally adapted or culturally developed um, with the communities to support these families. I just wanted to end on some programmatic implications to kind of tie all of our, all of our presentations together. Uh, we need to support caregivers who are providing the, the most intimate care for these children. We need to build comprehensive monitoring systems that leverage existing programs and offer training programs for healthcare workers and parents to be able to identify the earliest delays. And to support children presenting with the earliest signs of delay, we also need to establish clear and effective referral pathways for prevention and treatment further along the line. And lastly, we need rigorous multidisciplinary research to develop and test interventions and implement interventions that are tailored specifically for families affected by HIV. So I wanted to acknowledge our incredible HOPE study team, our incredible FACET study team in Botswana, our funders at CIFAR and NICHD, and our MIND team. And thank you so much for having us. Thanks to Dr. Bolterist. Um, thank you, Nugent. And I'm glad to say that Dr. Wamala has now joined us as well. So um, the floor is open for questions. Um, uh, Dr. Mazur, are there any questions in the room? I, I can't resist asking about confounders. So for the hearing loss, how do you know it's not from CMV? You know, we know that infected um, people, uh, infected moms, infected adults may have a higher rates of CMV. And so how do we know that um, the baby's hearing isn't from CMV? And then the other one is about this new generation of exposed and uninfected babies where there's sort of the, the population of moms who get diagnosed during pregnancy and then they get started on ART. And so there must be some period of time with a relatively high viral load and the baby's exposed to that, as opposed to now, hopefully, this new generation where moms are um, diagnosed earlier on and are on ART and are essentially, you know, undetectable viral load when they get pregnant. And so the baby's exposed to a mostly undetectable viral load through pregnancy. Is there a difference between those? So with the hearing, it's something that we'd love to explore. We actually have um, initiated hearing assessments in a cohort with very detailed data on both um, CMV infection as well as CMV viremia early in childhood. And we hope that those details will help us disentangle that relationship. I think one challenge is just that um, the cohort that I just mentioned is um, not large and um, considering, you know, the, the rate of hearing loss, it will probably be difficult to really understand those relationships. I think one of the reasons why um, Dr. Gallagher and Dr. Degwa are so excited about the newer technologies for hearing screening that we're looking at in our R21 is because we hope that it will help us conduct larger studies to really understand those exposures and risk of hearing loss because it's an incredibly important question. And then related to your um, really good question about maternal health and pregnancy and poorer outcomes for neurocognitive functioning in infants. Um, I, 
it certainly seems plausible that with poor health in pregnancy, there may be um, increased um, exposure to certain aspects. Um, for example, in one study, there was a, a finding that um, higher levels of viral load during pregnancy um, was associated with worse neurodevelopmental outcomes. So certainly that relationship could exist. Um, I have a question for the team. How do you deal with the heterogeneity of assessment tools that are available for um, studying neurodevelopment? And um, and how, how many of these tools have been validated across different cultural settings? Thank you, Donna. That is a really good question, too. Um, I'll, I'll just step in. I, I've used many, many of these tools across cohorts. Some of the, co the tools that we've used, um, such as um, the one that it de was depicted on the slide that I showed, it's called the Kaufman Assessment Battery for, for Children. It's a great tool. Many groups um, who have cohorts in, in Sub-Saharan Africa use it to assess children. Um, it is also a Western tool. Um, the Malawi Developmental Assessment Tool, by contrast, was really developed in Malawi and was intended to be a contextually relevant tool. Um, so there are pros and cons uh, with all tools. Um, with something like the Kaufman Assessment Battery for Children, it's very robust, um, gives you a lot of detail. The Malawi Neurodevelopmental Assessment Tool may give a little bit less detail in terms of cognitive functioning. So there, I guess the, the overarching sort of takeaway message is that um, in general, we lack, a you know, there's no perfect tool and what we, I think the best that we can do is um, when we're conducting these types of studies is try to balance the pros and cons and try to select a tool that best fits the, the context and the needs of the study question. Sometimes questions can be answered with less detailed um, tools and sometimes questions related to like very, um, difficult to detect biologic exposures really require a very detailed tool. Um, I think we can go ahead and close. And um, I'd really like to thank um, Dr. John Stewart, Dr. Walmala, Dr. Benki Nugent, and Dr. Volteris for this wonderful panel presentation. Have a great day, everybody.